Stanford University. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome back, um, everybody. Uh, as Markus uh, told you, I'm, I'm an uh, experimentalist. I think this is the first uh, presentation today by an experimentalist. And you will see there is a different viewpoint um, on various aspects. I will touch on a couple of things that uh, Robin uh, showed already this morning, extra interaction with, with matter. But as I said, from an um, experimentalist uh, point of view. Maybe <coughs> one or two sentences more about, about my, myself. I actually I started, when I started doing science, I did uh, atomic physics in Hamburg. Um, and then they told me to get out of the gas phase. That's what a PhD student there told me. <laughs> and so I did. I <laughs> got out of the gas phase. And uh, I do now spectroscopy on, on many different things, uh, biocatalysis, catalysis, and many, many other things. And I work at the ESF in France. Um, so as you, uh, as you know, this is supposed to be interactive. Uh, interactive does not mean I double checked over lunch again with the organizers. Double, uh, interactive does not mean that we watch the World Cup together and bet on the different teams. It means that you, uh, unfortunately, but it means that you ask me questions during the talk. So whenever something is not clear, just uh, ask a question. It also means that I can ask you questions. Um, there will be a little warning uh, when, uh, when, I, when I'm ready to ask you a question, if I, when I have prepared something. So a quiz, I will quiz you and, um, and this comes up, right? Uh, so you will be warned. Okay, so what, uh, ah, okay. Um, there's some literature, actually, uh, Robin showed uh, this morning already a couple of books, but with, uh, here I show my preferences. Um, the X-ray interaction with matter is, is still very nicely done in this old book by, by Sakurai, I like this a lot. Um, and then the, one of the latest versions here, with Winfried Schülke, who's one of the godfathers of uh, of uh, photon in, photon out spectroscopy or, or uh, photon scattering. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful book here. If you're interested in uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, it was mentioned this morning as well, X-ray absorption near edge structure and exafs. Um, there's a book, a recent book by Grant Bunker here, who's at the IIT in Chicago. A very nice introduction to uh, X-ray absorption fine structure. And then there's another book here on, uh, this is a more air ledges in 3D transition metals. By, by Frank de Roth and Akio Kotani, also quite, quite recent and um, <clears throat> gives a very nice overview uh, over um, LH spectroscopy and also um, photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, mainly in solid state systems. Okay, so what uh, will I talk about? Uh, again, I will, there will be a little bit of an overlap with, uh, with what uh, was said this morning. I talk again about interaction of X-rays with matter. And then I also talk a little bit on how me as an experimentalist, how I see that uh, um, inner shell spectra are calculated. Um, there are many spectroscopists, I think, who will be talking during this uh, school here. Uh, I think uh, Michael will also then go more into detail as a proper theoretician. He will probably do this right. Uh, so I just give you a little introduction on how I see how inner shell uh, spectra are calculated. I talk about X-ray emission spectroscopy. Uh, cater towards applications at free electron lasers, because I think this is relevant to the community here. And i also talk a little bit, if time is left, uh, about resonant inelastic um, X-ray scattering. Okay? Uh, so I start with very basic uh, aspects. So why, why, do we, um, why do we do X-ray spectroscopy? Of course, we hope to get information about the electronic structure and the atomic structure uh, from the sample, obviously, right? And the, the reason why we do inner shell spectroscopy, so hard X-ray, photon in, photon out spectroscopy, uh, is an inner shell spectroscopy. And the, the important point there is it's element specific. Right? That's always the reason. If you were to write a proposal and you propose, I want to do inner shell spectroscopy on a certain system, the reason why I do this is because it's element selected. Right? That's the, that's the most important thing. And here you see the, uh, just the theoretical or the tabulated values for the cross sections here in the range from 6,000 to 9,000 electron volts. And you see that different elements, this is for an, a sample that contains iron and cobalt. And as you know very well, you get your absorption edges at different energies for the different elements. That's why it's element selective, right? And the X-ray emission, so the fluorescence, you can call it fluorescent, that comes out of the sample is, of course, also element selective, right? So the, the, the k alpha lines or k-beta lines from the different elements, they also appear at different energies. So also element selective um, in the X-ray emission. When you do uh, hard X-rays, why do we do hard X-ray spectroscopy? Um, uh, we do this because of the large penetration depth of the um, of the X-rays, right? So if you want to do, for example, experiments under extreme conditions, so many what people do a lot, they take a, 
a so-called diamond anvil cell, so they're two diamonds that press the sample together to, uh, to hundreds of, of gigapascals, so they can study conditions that you find in the, in, inside the Earth. Um, then you need hard x-rays and you can um, that penetrate through the diamond here and they get the x-rays out again, right? So that's the reason why you would do hard x-ray spectroscopy. So it's bulk sensitive for the sample, but also you can do experiments under in situ conditions. I want to put this a little bit with context because you will also hear speakers later this week uh, who will, I think, at least talk mainly about soft x-ray spectroscopy. So we have the hard x-rays and the soft x-rays. Hard x-rays start usually, that's a convention, hard x-rays start above, let's say, 5,000 electron volts, <coughs> and soft x-rays are at lower energies. Um, if you want to study the electronic structure, in principle, you want to use soft x-rays. Um, because the spectral, the, the, the line broadening is, is, is smaller when you use soft x-rays, and it's easier to access uh, the electronic structure when you do, uh, when you do soft x-ray spectroscopy. For example, in 3D transition metals, you can see the, the, the structure of the 3D orbitals directly by a 2P to 3D absorption, and uh, that gives you directly then the, um, the electronic structure of the 3D orbitals. If you, however, as I told you before, if you want to do experiments under hard X-ray, uh, under in situ conditions and uh, in, under extreme conditions, you want to use, you want to use hard X-rays because they have a, a larger penetration depth. Um, so, what are the challenges in the two techniques? So, if you do soft X-rays, if you go a synchrotron, for example, Bessie in Berlin, uh, where they use mainly soft X-rays. Um, they, are, they can easily study the electronic structure of the system, but they have to improve the way um, how they can study a system under in situ conditions, right? They do very tricky things. If, they, if you want to do uh, an experiment in catalysis, for example, if you want to study a chemical reaction, you have to flow a gas through your sample, and, and this is very difficult for soft X-rays, but they're improving those uh, in situ cells uh, with very uh, thin windows that are only like a micron or less um, thick. Um, they're improving uh, the conditions here enormously here in Berkeley at the ALS as well. Um, so the soft X-ray people, they're working on improving the in-situ conditions. We hard X-ray people, so I belong to this community on the right. Um, we have to develop techniques. We have to improve uh, our spectros spectroscopic techniques to be better access the, um, the electronic structure, the information about uh, electronic structure in the sample. And this is kind of my domain, so I'm working on this, trying to develop techniques where we can uh, use hard X-rays and learn something about the electronic structure in the system. Um, here, for comment, in, so the energy range in the uh, above 1,000 electron volts and 5,000 electron volts is by some people referred to as the tender X-ray range. It's just kind of in between the soft X-rays and the hard X-rays, and people like this. I think they, people in Paris, they came up with this, so it shows that also uh, scientists have a hard uh, romantic streak. Anyway, um, so, so what, what I will talk about is X-ray absorption, X-ray absorption and X-ray emission spectroscopy. Yeah? So how do you measure an absorption spectrum? You all know this, I repeat it anyway. So you have your X-rays coming from the source. Uh, that may be the free electron laser, can also be a storage ring. Um, and then you, you pick an energy, so you use, a, in the hard X-ray range, a double crystal monochromator, so a silicon, two silicon crystals here. And uh, they select an energy, and this energy then hits your sample and goes through the sample. And then using the, the bayer lambert law, this gives you the absorption cross-section. Yeah, the linear absorption coefficient. And you see here, this is then the chemical sensitivity. These are two um, ion compounds now. This is the ion KH. And you see here a high spin system. This is a molecular complex, a low spin system. And you see, depending on the on the structure and the spin state of the system, you get give different data. Yeah? Now we don't only have uh, element selectivity. On top, we have chemical sensitivity, right? It was, uh, Robin mentioned this already this morning. Yeah? So it's very important that we have chemical sensitivity so we learn about the chemical environment of the sample. We can do this now also with the X-rays that come out from the sample, that are scattered from the sample, right? So if the energy out and the intensity out, and in order to analyze the spectrum <coughs> of the X-rays that come out, I again have to analyze the X-rays. What I do, I again use a single crystal. In this case, we call it an analyzer crystal. It's experimentally a little bit uh, differently done than in this case. But again, so I get a spectrum also for the emitted X-rays. And again, I have a chemical sensitivity. Yeah? Not only elemental selectivity, also a chemical sensitivity. So a high spin compound gives me a different spectrum um, than a low spin compound. Yeah? So for both uh, absorption and emission, I have as well a chemical sensitivity. That's important. OK, now how do I? 
see spectroscopy, how do I understand spectros spectroscopy uh, in, a general, in a general way? Yeah, so now I give you a little, uh, as, a, as I said before, an experimentalist's uh, approach um, <clears throat> to spectroscopy. Uh, let's assume, I show here on the vertical scale, I show the total energy of the system. Let's assume I have a Hamiltonian that can do, or I can solve the Hamiltonian, including all nuclei, all electrons in the system, so the ideal case, which of course is not realistic. But let's see, let's assume we can do this, and it gives me a total energy of the system, yeah? So at lowest energy in the ground state, I'm at the lowest energy, and I know of the system that are excited states, right? At have higher total energy, I have excited states, right? I have yeah, like sharp excited states that are sharp in energy or a little bit broader. Um, uh, if you have a band formation, for example, then you may have broader states. And at different total energies, I have all those states, yeah? And now you wonder, um, how can I, I want to probe the states. I want to learn something about the system, um, so I want to probe a little bit my, my excited states in the system, okay? So my photon comes in, so I put energy into the system, the energy is absorbed by the system, and, and then I reach those excited states, and uh, the probability for reaching those excited states is this uh, matrix element, so the transition matrix element. So it gives me the, the, um, where the oscillator strength, um, the probability of reaching, of reaching this uh, intermediate state, I call this N here. Okay, and this is an excited state. The excited state lives for a certain time, the lifetime tau, and then will decay. There are many different decay channels now. It can be a radiative decay, it can be a non-radiative decay. The non-radiative decay would be Auger decay. I worry about a radiative decay because I talk about photon in, photon out spectroscopy, right? The photon out is the radiative um, decay, yeah? So this excited state now uh, decays into those uh, other excited states um, at lower energies relative to the original case, right? And uh, what is important here I may, it, in some cases, it may be possible to reach those excited states also directly from the ground state, okay? So then I have two ways of probing the same state. Either I get, go like this, so in a two-step process, or directly, okay? Um, now, uh, so going back, I, I just talked about those states in a very general, so if they just, I'd solve the Schrodinger equation, and I, I, I obtain all those excited states, and then, uh, I say I can reach with my spectroscopy, I can reach the states uh, with a certain probability. Now we go to the one electron picture that was mentioned this morning as well by Robin. Um, and I want, I want to give name to those states. Just having a state is, I, is not very helpful. I want to discuss science. I want to, in a paper, I want to, I want to write something. I reach the state and I want to uh, give a name to the state, right? And in a one, one electron picture, which is an approximation, right? So I, I'm, I'm entering now an approximation. I, I give names to the states. So in this case, um, if I do hard X-ray spectroscopy, let's say on an ion system, um, I reach an intermediate state where I take a 1s electron out. So in the ground state, I have 1s2. I take an electron out and put an additional electron into the 3D shell. So I start in the ground state of 3D5 and then go to an intermediate state and have a 1s1 3D6 state. Okay, if I go to higher energies, I have, again, I take a 1s electron out and I put another electron into a p state. It was also discussed this morning, right, in, concept, in, the, in the context of, of x subs, where do I put uh, my electron? So I put it into a, well, it becomes maybe a continuum electron which has p symmetry with respect to the absorbing atom, right, relative to the absorbing atom. And then I have at lower energies, I have, uh, I replace the 1s hole with a, 2P5, with a 2p hole, so the configuration here is 2p5, 3d5, and, and, and. and the, the, the electrons in valence shell, they are kind of spectators, uh, they don't do anything. All I do here is I replace uh, the 1s hole with a 2p hole and a 3p hole. And I can go to lower total energies, and in this case, actually, I, I have a hole then in a, that would be a molecular orbital, I call this a molecular orbital, so you have a hole in an orbital that is um, <coughs> within the valence shell. Okay, and what is interesting now, I told you I can, I can, well, first I give names now, this is the K-alpha line and this is the K-beta line. So you heard about the fluorescence lines that come out of your sample, K-alpha lines, you find this in the, in the book, for, for example, in this nice orange book, Berkeley book, you find the energies for those uh, transitions here, K-alpha line, K-beta line, and, um, uh, and here in this case you have, we call this transition here valence to core, uh, transition because an electron from a valence orbital actually fills uh, the 1s hole in this case. Okay? Um, now, I told you I can reach those 
final states as well directly, and this would be, in this case, it's the K edge. I'm sorry, I didn't write this. This would be the K absorption edge, and lower energy is the L edge or the M edge. Yeah, so in principle, I have two ways of, of reaching those states here, either via the K edge or directly via, uh, with a one photon process um, directly, and that would be then the L edge and the M edge. And down here, lowest energies, you even have UVV spectroscopy. This would not be an inner shell spectroscopy. This is what you do. Many, maybe some of you did this already in the lab. You have a UVV uh, spectrometer. And uh, if you have this, you probe those states down there. Yeah? So what is important about this, um, it's a total energy diagram that considers all multi-electron all multi -electron effects in principle. Um, the states here are. Uh, or the names that I give to the states here are multi-electron states, so I consider all electrons of the system. That's important as well. It observes energy conservation, and um, in principle, what is nice about a multi-electron picture like this, a total energy di diagram like this, I can put all my spectroscopies in one diagram, right? So I see my UV Vista spectroscopy and the hard X-ray spectroscopies, okay? Um, and of course, if I have a radiative decay, then of course the, the energy comes out. Okay, now, uh, since this is it's important to me, it's an important point, uh, this multi-electron diagram. Um, I do a little, we, do, we play a little quiz, we do a little game now. What you're probably familiar with is this one electron diagram. Yeah, I mean, most of you probably see this when you, I don't know, when you study. Um, you see, if, if, if somebody explains to you what, what, what are the different transitions in, in spectroscopy, um, they usually, they draw the different orbitals here. Uh, so that's not a multi-electron diagram, right? So one electron. So we have a 1s shell here, and then the electron goes out. This is what you see in, in many books. And uh, yeah, so either the electron goes way above the Fermi level, this is the Fermi energy, or it go just above into a 3D level. Um, and then I have the decay. I have a K beta line, 3P, uh, oops, uh, oops, uh, yeah, 3, uh, 3P to 1s. So I can call this non-resonant K beta or resonant K beta if I ex excite it into a, a level just above the uh, the Fermi energy that would be then a resonant excitation and the resonant K-beta line. So now what we like to do, what I would like to do with you, is we translate this diagram again into a multi-electron diagram. Okay? So now I need your participation. So we have the total energy diagram. So we start at the ground state. So where, where do I put the ground state? Do I put the ground state up here? Any comment? So I put the ground state down there. Okay? Do you agree? <laughs> Excellent. We start with the ground set. 1s2, 3dn. OK. Now I excite my system. So if I have a 1s2, uh, let's say, continuum excitation, what, would be, what name do I give to this, uh, to this excitation there? Any comments? How many, how many 1s electrons do I have here? One. one. Excellent. 1s1. And the electron goes to, let's say, some kind of a so 3dn, and I call this epsilon p. Epsilon would mean a continuum electron, OK? And again, we have then the, for, for a resonant excitation, we say we put a 1s electron and put the 1s electron in the 3d shell, so 3dn plus 1, OK? It's a quadrupole transition. Maybe you're worried about selection rules. We, it's, uh, that exists. We can observe this, OK? Now, for this decay, so what would be my, um, I hope it doesn't show up. Now I have the k-beta decay. So what is the configuration there of the final state? Where, where is my coal? I, have not, I don't have 1s1. I have uh, 3p5. OK. And 3p5. And the, the electron I carry along, right? The epsilon p spectator, it stays up there at 3dn. Yeah? And the same is for the resonant excitation here down here. It goes, I replace the 1s hole with the 3p. Yeah? Yeah, so this is the difference, one electron diagram and multi-electron diagram. Um, if you want to understand spectroscopy, I recommend that you use this diagram because uh, it's, it's, it's uh, um, more physical, you could say. It's, it's, uh, it, as I said, it observes energy conservation. You can really understand uh, processes, also multi-electron excitations end to end. This is qualitative, right? So it shows you qualitatively what's, what is going on. Um, but some processes are very difficult to explain in a, multi, in, a, in a one electron diagram like this. And I will show you a little bit later when this is the case. Okay? Okay, electromagnetic radiation. I think this was already addressed uh, this morning. I don't have to go too much into detail. Um, we do scattering. I do photon in, photon out spectroscopy. So we look at the scattering of photons, right? So we have a photon coming in with energy or frequency, a k vector, and polarization. And then it's scattered. 
this angle here is my scattering angle, and uh, the, uh, the vector here is the so-called is the momentum transfer. It's the difference between the incoming and the outgoming um, photon uh, k vector of your uh, of the photon, right? Scattering angle here, and the difference between the two energies is the energy transfer. Okay, so I describe my uh, as was shown this morning, I described my photon with a, with a vector field here. And what is important, it was mentioned then, I have two terms that are important. They are the, the A square term and the P dot A term. Everything with the, 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 the theory behind this was explained this morning. Um, for me now, uh, just, we just remember that we have the A square term and the A dot P term. As an experimentalist, I should not show uh, those scattering <laughs> diagrams. But still, I, th I find it useful. What is important is that for this A square term, um, I do not create an intermediate state. So I have my ground state coming here, my photon coming here, and the photon is scattered right away without creating an intermediate state. If I have a p dot a term, I, uh, I have my ground state here, my um, photon coming, and then I create an intermediate state that lives for a certain time, the lifetime tau, and then I have the final state going on and the photon coming out. Yeah? What is, so let's look first at the a square term. Um, so actually, I have to say, what, what I do here is maybe theoretically not entirely exact because the two terms, they interfere. The correct formulas weren't shown, uh, were shown this morning, but they, they, the two terms uh, appear within the, the square of the modulus. Um, I separate them. I consider now the case that either one of the two terms dominates, so I neglect the other one. Okay? So if I look only first at the A square term, then my, the scattering intensity is proportional to this term here. Right? So I have the uh, the ratio between the energies out and in. I have the polarizations here, dot product, and I have all this. This is the matrix element between your ground state and the final state, and this is the energy conservation. And this part here is called the dynamic structure factor that tells you about, uh, gives you information about the electronic structure in your system, the response of the system um, to your perturbation of the, uh, using the photon. Okay? Now, I have various terms here. This is, uh, the, uh, historically, um, the, the different names popped up because the different people here they discovered di different aspects of the scattering uh, cross section. So uh, Thompson scattering and Bragg scattering are so-called elastic scattering when the incoming and the outcoming energies are identical, are equal. Yeah. So Thompson Bragg, these two cases, uh, uh, inelastic scattering is uh, is Raman scattering and Compton scattering. These are the two inelastic scattering uh, processes that are based on this a square term. Yeah. What is important now is this, this operator. Um, ah, actually, ah, I have a quiz again. So the question here, I'm an experimentalist. And now I wonder, I, I can change this angle there in my experiment. right? And let's say, assume I want to minimize this term because I don't want to see it. I want to see all other terms. What, what experimental configuration would you recommend to me? When, when, when does this, uh, this term here is, uh, is minimal? It's even zero, the way it's written there. Any idea? In the case, I'm sorry I didn't tell you that, so it's a hint. Well, it's, I have to tell you that. Incoming light is linear polarized like this. So the incoming light is linear polarized. So at what scattering angle theta here is my intensity zero, the scattered intensity? Any idea? Ed? At 90 degrees. If I, if I look here, if theta goes to 90, because of the dot product here, it goes to zero. Yeah? And that's important. Everything, all those scattering parts here, they go to zero if I look at 90 degrees. Um, so I don't see them anymore. That's a nice way. And we do this all the time. If I measure at the, if I do experiments, uh, fluorescence detected absorption spectroscopy, whatever, we always measure at 90 degrees we, because in this case, we're not interested in this term. Other people at other experiments are interested in that term. They should not measure at 90 degrees. Yeah? OK. So, that's, now we have to worry about this operator. And this operator here that, that connects the ground state with the final state is very interesting because it contains, um, this, the, this is the momentum transfer, as I told you before. Yeah? So the, the momentum transfer is inside this operator, which is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And this is the case, I'm sorry, this is the case for, for Raman scattering. Um, by varying the momentum transfer here, I can change the selection rules. I can change my transition matrix element here by varying the scattering angle here. Uh, and that, that is very interesting. Um, in the so-called, there's a technique, it's called X-ray Raman scattering. So actually, I start with all the spectroscopies. I start with the most esoteric one. Um, so there's something called, based on this A-square term, called the X-ray Raman, um, 
X-ray Raman spectroscopy. And I show you here, this is done by, by a colleague of mine, Simu Otari, who is now in, in Helsinki. He did beautiful, uh, wrote beautiful papers on, on, on this kind of spectroscopy. So what you see here is the energy transfer. So the energy transfer to the sample when the, when the, when the photons are scattered. And um, what you see here is the Compton peak, right? And you know with increasing momentum transfer, the Compton peak moves out uh, to higher energy transfer. Yeah, you see, so what, what you see here for the different colors, the momentum, uh, momentum transfer changes. Um, and on top of the Compton peak, you see uh, uh, a, a line here. Does anybody know what that could be? What the, what the, edge, the edge that you see, what, what this could be? Any idea? It's, it's the carbon. What you see here is the carbon K edge. Yeah? So you see at a fixed energy transfer, you see the carbon K edge coming up. The spectra were measured, so just to make this clear to you. So you come in, you hit your sample, let's say with 10,000 electron volts, with a photon that has 10,000 electron volts. Then you measure the scattered X-rays at 10,000 minus, let's say, roughly 200, no, 280, let's say roughly 300 electron volts, so at 9,700 electron volts. You measure your scattered X-rays. So the energy transfer is roughly 300 electron volts, which corresponds to the 1s result, the binding energy of the 1s electron in the carbon atom. Yeah, so that's a, they call this a loss spectroscopy. Yeah, so it's a hard X-ray technique because I go in with hard X-rays, go out with hard X-rays, but I measure the edge uh, at 280 electron volts. So I measure the edge of a low Z element in the, that is usually in the soft X-ray range. Yeah, it's called X-ray Raman spectroscopy. Why am I showing you this? Because it's it's, a, it's an interesting option also for um, for free electron lasers because I in order to measure the spectrum I can scan. The emitted, I can scan the, um, my, my emission spectrometer, so the, the analyzer that I showed you before. So it's not the incident energy that I have to scan. It's the, uh, or I can, I don't have to scan the incident energy. I can scan the energy of my emission spectrometer, so the energy that is uh, scattered from the sample. Yeah. Um, so I think to date it has not been used at the free electron laser. It's more and more used at uh, at synchrotron radiation sources uh, because I can, for example, study water. So there are many people, I think Mikael was involved as well, and other speakers <coughs> here, they studied the oxygen K-edge in water um, using this kind of technique uh, because I can use hard X-rays, uh, or hard X-rays in general are more su suitable to study liquids than soft X-rays. So it's a very beautiful technique. And another publication here by, by Simo, um, he combined uh, this X-ray Raman scattering technique together with imaging. So what he did, he put um, graphite, a diamond, uh, diamond into graphite, and as you know, both are made of carbon, but uh, the bonding is different, right? So they give you a different spectroscopic signal, right? So if you look, diamond gives you, this is the carbon K edge again, you see here, 280, 290 electron volts. Uh, diamond gives you a different spectrum than graphite at the carbon edge. And uh, he used a very small beam, and with the spectrometer that he used, he had uh, position resolution as well. And then he turned his sample, so he did something like a tomography on the sample, and he get a, a three-dimensional image of the diamond um, inside the carbon. A, a beautiful experiment. Uh, used, and it's only possible to do this if you use hard X-rays, because if I go with 10,000 EV inside the sample, I penetrate the sample sufficiently in order to be able to do this kind of uh, uh, of imaging, a beautiful experiment and a nice application of this X-ray Raman technique. <clears throat> yeah? Now you presented that the hard X-ray is necessarily the, the method of choice. But of course, since it's, it's penetrating better if you have really thin samples, it also means you get way less signal out than from soft X-ray because true. it's not efficient enough, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, you, you, what X-rays you use uh, depends on, on, on many aspects. And if you, if you have a very thin sample, of course, you may want to do this uh, imaging using soft X-rays. But they absorb, of course, enormously. Uh, you, you, the samples are thinner than a micron, right, that I have to make in many cases. Well, it depends on what element you look at. Another, and now it gets very technical as well, um, another aspect uh, of this X-ray Raman scattering is that if I, again, if I change uh, the momentum transfer here, I can expand the exponential function here. If I, if I vary the momentum transfer, I change um, the selection rules within this matrix element. So I can access different parts of my electronic structure um, as a function of the momentum transfer. You see here, this is a very nice publication by, by the people here. So here they vary uh, the momentum transfer and the spectrum changes dramatically. And the reason is that um, this transition operator changes as a function of the momentum transfer and I reach different final states depending 
on uh, what term is dominating here in my in my expansion. Uh, that's a fa fa fascinating tool. So just imagine if I normally if I uh, look at a transition from a 2p orbital, I probe three, the d density of states or d orbitals, right? Using the, this technique, I can instead of going to d, I can go to f directly from p, right? And I learn I get a more complete picture of the electronic structure of my system. Yeah. So this is the uh, the beauty of uh, of X-ray Raman spectroscopy. Okay, so we move on. We go now to the a, a dot p term um, that appears here in the Kramers Heisenberg equation. It was shown already before. Uh, so your ground state, transition operator, intermediate state. It also corresponds to the diagram that I showed you before. So intermediate state and here again transition operator and the final state. Okay, again now the the trans transition operator here now does not contain um, the momentum transfer. Right? What you see here is the photon vector, um, the, the vector to, for, for the electron uh, position and uh, momentum, and the polarization of your, of your X-rays. Okay? You can expand it as well. This gives you then the dipole and quadrupole selection rules. I don't want to go into detail there because you find it on Wikipedia. Um, yeah, so this part here is then um, responsible or gives is, the, uh, is, dumb or is, is, is due to the A dot P term in your um, uh, treatment of the uh, of the uh, perturbation um, Hamiltonian. Okay, what you can do now, if you imagine if this scattering angle now goes to zero, then in principle you have forward scattering, which is absorption, in principle absorption. So coherent forward scattering can be viewed as, uh, for co so it's coherent for forward scattering, that means that the phase uh, is, uh, is preserved and the uh, it's elas elastic scattering, elastic forward scattering, polarization is preserved as well, and it leads to the total absorption at the end. Um, so you can view you can view absorption as a photon in photon out process, right? The photon hits the sample, comes out again, and uh, in this case, uh, yeah, if you if you view uh, absorption spectroscopy as a photon in photon out process, it's elastic forward scattering, and you can treat it the same on the same footing here on the same uh, theoretical framework. Um, again, here now a quiz. Now, because I tried to simplify the Kramers Heisenberg equation here, um, do you know? Yeah? I, I didn't understand the, the last part with the zoom forward scattering being seen as absorption spectroscopy. Because it's, it's a two photon term. In absorption spectroscopy, the photon is kind of destroyed, dissipated into heat, whatever. It's gone. But it's not scattered to lower energy. It's, uh, this is a, a discussion we can then leave maybe on the, on the board. Um, I've been discussing a lot uh, this this point with with different uh, theoreticians. If you, I have this from Sakurai. Sakurai treats it like this, um, and, and I like it for several reasons. In principle, the way I argue is if you if a photon is absorbed, you have reached an excited state that lives for a certain time and it has to decay. Um, so if I only observe the absorption process, I do not care about the, uh, care about the decay afterwards, right? You can say I, I just I neglect it, yeah? Then I would say it's a P dot A in the first order term. Um, I hesitate a little bit to, to accept this because I cannot just forget what happens after the absorption process, right? It decays after a certain time. And uh, if I look at the radiative decay, I have a photon out, photon in, photon out process. Okay, I neglect now the non-radiative in, radiative, in, radiative decays. And, uh, I come up, if it's uh, in the forward direction, if it's elastic, then it becomes absorption. So then this absorption becomes the photon in, photon out process. Another view, what, what some people write in their books, is that I absorb, observe or consider the absorption process as uh, the, the, the beam is attenuated, right, in, in your sample. So it's a, partly, a partially constructive, uh, destructive interference between, the, between two waves. But if you have an OJDK happening? That's exactly. That's... The, that's if you have an Auger decay happening, then you, uh, process happening, then you probably have to look at it more carefully. Still, it's a two-step process, right? You have an excited state and the decays then further. If I consider the P dot A term only in first order, I still don't care about what happens after my excited I state. A, I have a more fundamental problem with this. I mean, in your picture, essentially, the photon number is conserved. That is, if you consider exactly, if you, well, say it's an elastic, it's an elastic scattering process, then photon comes in, you speak about it as absorption, your picture would get shifted. But I can, I can count the number of photons that go through a sample, and I'm pretty sure that the you have less photon photons afterwards. <laughs> the photon, right. photon number is after. That, that's exactly, if in, in this view, in this view, uh, 
I, I struggle a little bit as well to try to, to bring this to terms. But in the terms of, if you look at it as a wave, the attenuation of a wave, and then it doesn't make sense. It also makes sense um, that I do have forward scattering, right? This process is not, uh, uh, but we can discuss this maybe later. As I said, uh, I, I followed here the, the discussion by, for example, Sakura and other people in other book. But if you uh, view it as a, as a number of, count the number of photons uh, that suddenly disappears, still you cannot argue with my argument that you have an excited state that it's decays. And if it decays radiatively, um, something has to happen to the, uh, to the excited state. Um, but anyway, we, we discuss later. It's maybe a nice, it's, it's, it's a nice exercise to think about this and to... Uh, it actually can decay in a number of different modes, which is not necessarily the mode that was in. It can, of course, you have, you have many different decay paths. Yeah. That's true. Okay, so let's look at the interference terms here. Um, so what, what does interference mean? Does, do you know what interference means? How can I... How does interference uh, show up here in this, um, in this equation? Does anybody? Uh, so you have a sum within the square, right? So that means you have the squared, each term squared, plus cross terms between the different matrix elements, right? Because you have a sum, and then you square the sum, right? So you always have some interference. Yeah? So if you, let's try to simplify the Kramers Heisenberg equation here by uh, first neglecting interference terms. Interference would happen between, uh, if I go from the, from the ground state, decay into the same final state, and uh, those, let's say, assume those intermediate states, they interfere, okay? Now we ignore the interference effects, and then it becomes, uh, we inter ignore all interference terms, and then the, ground, the, the equation becomes, uh, becomes like this. So I have the square of the matrix elements divided by um, this well, denominator that is typical for the resonance. Um, if, I, if I look at this now carefully, I observe that I just have um, the product between absorption, because I take the square now, between absorption and emission, okay? If I, in the next step, that makes everything much, much easier, right? Because I can calculate my absorption cross-section and calculate the emission cross-section. I don't need to know the phase between them uh, because I, I take the square, um, and the problem is much, much easier to address theoretically. And the question is now, how far do we get by, 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 by using this assumption, this simplification? Um, if I now, and in certain cases, I can do this. And this is actually what is done in many cases when absorption spectra are calculated. I approximate my transition matrix element by the electron density in the system. That's a very harsh approximation. And uh, any upright theoretician will rebel against this, but this is what it's done in many cases just because we have to do it. We have no other way of addressing this problem. So the transition matrix element here is approximated by the electron density. In principle, there's another radial matrix element before that I'm neglecting here. You do this for the absorption process and for the, uh, for the emission process. Uh, you approximate the matrix element using the uh, density of states of the occupied, unoccupied states and the occupied states. And then this equation um, reads like this. Um, so this step, I will address this later as well. This step neglects all electron, electron interactions uh, or many um, multi-electron excitations. It neglects as well uh, partly the core hole potential. So there are many, many um, approximations there. But it works, I will show you in some cases or many cases. And then I get a very simple um, equation here of the Kramers Heisenberg equation that was published already at, in 99 uh, by those people here, where my um, scattering intensity is proportional simply to a convolution um, between the density of uh, occupied and unoccupied states divided by um, this term here. This is due to the lifetime broadening. Yeah. So the, the question is, um, now yeah, well, it's, it, 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 it's, it's kind of a, the, the approach there is we try out how far we get by approximating our matrix elements, the absorption process, absorption spectrum by the density of states. Yeah? And this is here, I show you for um, an experimental spectrum at the oxygen K edge um, in, in silicon dioxide. And this is the experimental spectrum, and this is the calculated density of states. Um, and you see in this case, it works quite nicely. So indeed, I can, in certain cases, I can approximate my absorption matrix element by the density of states. Um, one has to be very careful. It does not work um, 
for example, when I have excitations, and it will be, it will be discussed later uh, during this week, when I have excitations into the 3D orbitals of 3D transition metals, so iron, manganese, and then the L edges of uh, 3D transition metals, uh, this doesn't work. And uh, uh, people will discuss this after or later this week. Also, when I look, look at rare earths, the 4F orbitals are the, the valence orbitals in rare earths. Also, this approach doesn't work. And also, in core to core X ray emission spectroscopy, this approach does not work, and I will address this a little bit. Yeah? Just to, to show you um, a little bit, give you a feeling of um, how you can approach this problem of, of calculating inner shell spectra. Okay, uh, summary slide. So for the resonant term, I have here the, the, the resonant part of the Kramers Heisenberg equation with this transition operator. So this is what we're mainly concerned uh, with when we do um, um, element selective spectroscopy. And then we have the Thompson scattering term. And I showed you uh, this scattering term here is um, due to all those uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy that I showed you before, where you can change the transition matrix elements and then. Okay. Um, the two terms interfere. I neglect this. I put this here in bracket. You may wonder, uh, what is resonant? That's also an interesting question to, to contemplate a little bit. Uh, I think also this morning, Robin mentioned this a little bit. Uh, there was a question here, what, what is actually resonant? Um, in principle, when you look at the literature, you say resonant are excitations close to an absorption edge. Right? There's sharp resonances in the system. Yeah? But in principle, I could say also when I excite an electron from the 1s shell into the continuum, right? it becomes a, an electron, a free electron. In principle, it's also a resonance within this uh, continuum state. Yeah? So a strict definition of resonance is very difficult to do. In principle, you could say in a most general uh, definition that whenever I use this Kramer's Heisenberg term, I have um, a resonant excitation. And, uh, and that would actually refer to, uh, to, most, uh, to all element selective, uh, element selective spectroscopies, apart from the X-ray Raman spect uh, spectroscopy that I showed you before. Yeah, that would be a very general uh, definition of, um, of resonance. OK, so the next question, what can inner shell spectroscopy do, do for you? Um, in principle, we want to learn what I told, told you before. We want to learn about electronic transitions, and thus the electron density and electron configuration. This will tell you, as, as Robin mentioned already before, about bond distances. So you have an absorbing atom here. You have bond distances. You have bond angles. And uh, it will, may tell you about the type of number of ligands. So this is an extra spectroscopy. Okay. What is important is that, in principle, spectroscopy, using the selection rules, spectroscopy is symmetry selective. Yeah, it will tell you about the symmetry around the ground state. So how, how many of you are familiar with this, with this term here? This is the spin orbit term 2s plus 1l. So you're familiar with multiplets, atomic multiplets, and then end. Yeah? So I use this term in, in a certain coupling scheme, an LS coupling. I use this term in order to describe um, the symmetry of my ground state. And based on the selection rules, I will then can only reach certain excited states. Yeah? And the excited state is what I probe in my spectroscopy. Um, so that means I probe or I get information about the symmetry, the LS term of the ground state. So it's very important to remember that a, that a spectroscopy is symmetry selective. Yeah? So I probe the symmetry of my ground state. Um, I added this slide now because there was this discussion on um, um, what, what, what do I measure? Do I, can I measure oxidation states or write the, how much does uh, a k-edge shift as a function of the oxidation state? Um, that's a very fundamental question that, uh, that people discuss all the time. And uh, my, my reply to this question will always be, um, the oxidation state is not a, um, an observable. It's not a quantity that I can measure. The oxidation state is a, is a chemical concept that helps you to predict certain uh, stoichiometries in your, in your chemical equation. But it's not really a quantity what I would like to measure. If you try to translate this into a quantity that you can measure, uh, it would somehow relate to the charge per atom. Right? Roughly, right? You assume if I have, a, if I have a, an ion in oxi oxida oxidation state 3, that means I have a 3D5 configuration. Yeah? That means I would translate the concept of oxidation state into a number of electrons that I have on my, on my atom. Yeah? But this is a tricky question. Right? If you look, for example, this is a molecule, and this is the electron density map for at, at some energy. It's not important. There's manganese here in the middle, and then I have the electron density around. Now I have to assign electron density here to a certain atom. And you see it's a tricky business. I have to come up with a certain scheme, and there are many sophisticated schemes, in order to assign the electron density to a certain, um, uh, to a certain atom. 
but there's, it's, it's, there's no strict procedure. So it's not a strict observable how much charge I have um, on an atom. Yeah? So one has to be very careful when I ask the question or when, when, when I tell somebody, I can, I can tell you if I do my spectroscopy, I can tell you how, much, how many electrons I have on my absorbing atom. Uh, that's in principle not really what I, what I can measure. And uh, a little a philosophical uh, intermezzo. Um, I found there are two publications here, one by, by Robert Parr, who is very famous for coming up with a um, exchange functional and density functional theory. And in a publication, he was asking, what is an atom in a molecule? And, uh, and what he writes then says that uh, a mole an atom in a molecule is a numenon in the sense of Kant. I'm not asking you now what a numenon is. Um, I had to look it up myself. Wikipedia says, it's an object knowable by the mind or intellect, not by the senses. <laughs> so that, that's bad news for the initial spectroscopist, because we claim we do element selective spectroscopies. Anyway, so, um, but there is a point, I told you, I showed you this electron density map. So this is where they're coming from. They say, well, I have to look at the entire molecule, and my electrons are distributed over the entire molecule. It doesn't really make sense. That's the way I understand it in, in layman's terms. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to talk about an atom in a molecule. Um, there was a reply right away, as you can imagine, to this paper by uh, the group of Richard Bader. Richard Bader wrote a famous book, Atoms and Molecules, and came up with a way of projecting the electron density on the, on the, on the, on the atoms. And they reply, of course, an experimentalist has no doubt that he or she is measuring the properties of a single atom. We cannot solve this issue, but I'm showing you this in order to, I don't know, sensitize you a little bit to this, to this problem. I mean, what are the properties that we actually measure? In, in principle, when you read a publication, people like to write about uh, 4P and 3D, and, uh, but this doesn't really exist, right? I don't have spherical symmetry in my system, uh, so there are no 3D orbitals in principle. Um, yeah, it's very difficult, we, very difficult to find a language how we discuss electronic structure and how do I present my scientific results, spectroscopic results to the scientific community, what language do I use there, and that's tricky. Uh, so we have to f find observables, <laughs> really observables that I probe in my spectroscopy in order to then communicate my results to the community, and that's a very difficult task that I cannot solve here. Okay, just I want to point some more problems out to you <clears throat> when I do intershell spectroscopy. Yeah, so I remove the electron here. Um, that's the 1s electron. So this is a very simple picture of an atom. Yeah, a nucleus here, I take the 1s orbital out. What happens is that uh, I have 1s one, one electron less, so the nuclear charge is screened by 1s one S, S, uh, one electron less. So all other electrons, they feel this change of potential, obviously. They re relax, right? So the, the, the energy levels will relax. What can happen if I have this relaxation that not only I remove one 1s electron, uh, another electron, so when those, those shells, let's say they collapse a little bit, they react to the new potential, another electron uh, is excited from an occupied level to an unoccupied level. So that would be a multi-electron excitation. <clears throat> yeah? So that means what I told you before and what was discussed this morning, discussing spectroscopy using only one electron and assuming all other electrons are kind of spectators, is uh, a tricky business and may not work uh, in many cases. Yeah? So when I, when I calculate my, my absorption cross-section here, I, I assume this is a matrix element. So these are, I assume that those states are multi-electron states in the most general case. I can use many electron, um, like a wave function. I can approximate this. And this is what is done if I then ultimately do my calculations using the electron density, using density functional theory. So I approximate this multi-electron um, transition matrix element by these are one electron wave functions, as was shown this morning. And what I can do in order to somehow take care of the multi-electron processes, I can scale um, this matrix element by a prefactor. Uh, but this is kind of a, it's an approximation, yeah? In this case, I have one electron wave functions and then I can use density functional theory in order to calculate my, my absorption spectra. <clears throat> okay? So that's, again, this is now my experimentalist point of view, how uh, the two different ways of, of trying to calculate inner shell spectra, yeah? I can start um, with a nine. So I neglect all the, all the ligands. I have an absorber, an ion absorber in my system. I neglect all the ligands. So there's no oxygen, nothing. I just look, uh, it's an ion because I can remove maybe two electrons because I assume it's in oxidation state two. Yeah? And then I have a wave function. I have a Slater determinant that describes my system. Right? What I can do then, artificially, I can go from the spherical symmetry here to the local symmetry. So I have six oxygen ligands around. I have octahedral symmetry. And this I can simulate. Uh, 
uh, by assigning new symmetries to my 3D orbitals. So my, they're not 3D anymore, they become T2 orbitals or T2G orbitals, E, G orbitals, according to um, the symmetry that I may have um, in the real system, yeah? And that this is kind of done em 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 empirically. And I can split then the orbits. I have a crystal field splitting that splits the 3D orbitals. I can al also include covalency by mixing then several configurations. Um, so in this case, I, I, I treat all the, the, the effect of the ligands, I treat in an empirical way. And, uh, but what is the advantage here? I can treat, in principle, multi-electron excitations in an, in an accurate way. And uh, I also can include the interaction of the core hole um, with the valence electrons uh, in, a, in a rather accurate way. Yeah? And this is the ligand field multiplet theory. Some of you may have heard about this before. And it starts, as I said, it starts with a free ion. Alternatively, I start with the whole structure, so I'm not including only the, um, the ion, the absorber, but I include all my, my um, the ligands around, so they, the, the chemical environment is included, and in this case I do, in most cases, density functional theory, and I calculate the electron density, then there are ways of including the core hole. I say the approximative way that maybe some people are insulted, but anyway, I can include somehow the, the core hole and include multi-electron excitations as well. Um, in this case, I have a good treatment, obviously I have a good treatment of, of the ligands in long range order, because this is all considered in the, in the, uh, in the calculations. But it's more difficult to treat all the multi-electron multi excitations and, and treat the interaction of the valence electrons with the core hole, yeah? So these are roughly the, 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 the two approaches, the way I see it. Um, there's enormous uh, work at the moment to, to somehow merge the two uh, approaches. Uh, it's kind of the holy grail of inner shell spectroscopy. They're called ap initio multiplets. That means you calculate the electronic structure using all ligands ap initio and have all the multiplet structure because of the electron-electron interactions included. So they're called ap initio multiplets. And there are enormous, um, there's enormous progress that uh, I think Michael Odelius will talk about later, uh, later this week. This is just f to illustrate to you the, uh, the, the fundamental problem. There's another problem. In, uh, in inner shell spectroscopy, I, or I told you already about those multi-electron excitations, to give you an example, um, this is the, um, the L3 absorption edge, so I excited two P3 halves electron. Um, in serum dioxide, uh, what you see here is the experiment, experimental spectrum, the red line, and the blue line here are um, one electron um, calculations. So what we used here, what I used here is the FEF code, some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, the FEF code is in principle the density functional theory code um, that approximates um, the absorption spectrum using a one electron, uh, one electron transitions. And what you see, uh, those features here are missing. They're not coming out. The rest comes out quite nicely, but those features are missing, just plain missing, because it's a one electron code. Yeah? Then there's another code, which is called the single impurity Anderson model. And, and this code gets those multi-electron excitations, they get it quite nicely, but one has to say that this splitting here which comes out of the, in, in the one electron calculations, this splitting here is introduced in this code um, empirically. So it's kind of cheating, right? So the splitting here comes from the programmer. Uh, the programmer puts the splitting in here, while in this calculations, the splitting here comes out up in issue from the calculations, yeah? So that nicely in, in, um, illustrates the advantages and disadvantages of the, um, um, of the different approaches, so here, the fine structure of, the, in this case, it's the 5D band, the fine structure comes out of the calculations, but I do not have the multi-electron excitations, while in this case, I do have the multi-electron excitations, but the fine structure I have to put in by hand into the calculations, yeah? So again, what we would like to do in the future is have those two approaches combined, so I have the correct fine structure and the multi-electron excitations in one go. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. So you paid attention. I was hoping nobody would pay attention. No, but you did. And um, these are, so that totally, this is the 5D band. So these are transitions from 2P to 4F. <clears throat> and uh, in order to get them out from the calculations, uh, you have to do some tricks that I have to admit I was not aware. It's not only, you have to include quadrupole transitions, obviously, but there are also some tricks. The 4F orbitals in those calculations are not in the right position. So you have to um, tweak a little with the calculations to get your 4F orbitals in the right spot, which I didn't do um, back then. That's a simple explanation. Still a good question. Um, okay. There's one 
one thing I would like to mention, the multiplet theory, because I'm not sure to what extent, well, actually, the other speakers may, may address this as well. Uh, just a little, just to give you the idea uh, what multiplet theory uh, means. There's some, 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 um, a lot of literature actually on this. I don't have to go through it. You will have the slides. So the, the fundamental problem is uh, I have my 3D orbitals, let's say, in a 3D transition metal. If I have only one 3D electron, it's easy. My total energy is just the energy of all the other electrons, the rest, and, and plus the energy of this uh, electron in the 3D shell. Uh, if I have two 3D electrons, uh, how do I treat this? That's a big question. It's just not twice the energy. It's not that simple, unfortunately. Because what we have to do is we have to treat the interaction between those electrons, right? There's the Coulomb interaction between those, those two electrons. And I come up with a two electron operator. Um, I get matrix elements for this two electron operator. And what comes out then is the so-called the direct term and the exchange term. Yeah, it's a direct Coulomb term and the exchange term. And the exchange term is, uh, is an exchange interaction uh, that is zero if the spins of the two electrons are anti-parallel and it kicks in if the, uh, if the, two, if the spin of the two electrons um, is parallel and it enters the total energy with a, with a minus sign here. So when the two electrons are parallel, then I get a finite value here, so the total energy uh, is decreased. That's Hans rule, basically. So that's the reason for Hans rule. Um, yeah, and what those terms are then the Slater integrals or Raka parameters that you may have heard um, about. Okay, so what does that mean for my for my system where I have two uh, 3D electrons, right? So I have to couple the angular momenta of the of the two uh, of the two electrons. I have to couple the orbital angular momentum, and I have to couple the spin, which I didn't show here. These are the standard rules for the coupling of angular momenta that you probably learned in quantum mechanics. So I don't have to have to repeat this. Um, so I couple them, and then I have also have to observe the, the Heisenberg, um, the, I'm sorry, the Pauli exclusion principle. And what I find, if I go through all the, the quantum mechanics here, what I find that for a 3D2 configuration, I have all those states. Yeah, and that comes out of multiplet theory, atomic multiplet theory. Yeah, so I don't have just, uh, maybe you, you learned, I don't know, you learned the crystal field splitting or whatever. Um, you have to observe also the electron electron interactions that, that give you all those different terms. So I have five different energy levels for a 3D2 configuration. Yeah? And that's very important to consider because you observe actually those levels uh, when you do spectroscopy. Yeah. So when you do ligand field multiplet theory, uh, there are program codes. You may have heard of the Tolle code <coughs> that is um, managed by, by Frank de Roth in, uh, in Utrecht. So the code does, it starts with atomic calculations, introduces then the chemical environment that I was told you before. It branches to the appropriate uh, symmetry. And then I can somehow consider, I shouldn't write here hybridization, I'm sorry, it should be orbital mixing. So it considers somehow then the orbitals of the ligands as well. And I can, I can mix um, the different, um, by, by mixing different configurations. Okay? Um, so I told you I start with a 3D, con a 3D2 configuration and then I have those five levels just by looking at the atomic multiplets. On top of this now, I have the, the, the crystal field of the ligand, so I have an additional splitting on top. And the, the, all this combined uh, is shown in the so-called Tanamo-Zugano diagram. Who has heard of a Tanamo-Zugano diagram? Okay, that's very nice. Some people at least. It's usually important, uh, and I'm surprised that uh, this is not generally taught at universities, um, it's, as I said, hugely important if you want to understand uh, electronic structure in, for example, 3D transition metals, because this is what really happens in, you, in your sample. Yeah? So, I don't know. When you get the chance, look up uh, Tanabe, Tanabe Zugano diagrams and atomic multiplets, because this is important for electronic structure. Okay, so this was just a little, uh, uh, I, I, was, uh, I digressed a little bit <clears throat> to address this point, and I give you now some, um, well, some examples. For, for X-ray emission spectroscopy. Okay, I showed you this diagram before, a very busy diagram, and make it easier now to understand. Um, I want to look now at the K-beta lines, yeah? So I remove a 1S electron, have an excited state here, it decays, and then I have the K-beta line coming out. Um, and I replace the 1S hole with a 3P hole. In a one electron diagram, it's a transition from 3P to 1S. And I show you here, so in the, in, in the context of the other fluorescence lines coming out in manganese, you have the K-alpha lines here, the K-beta lines then, and these lines I will address later, the valence to core lines. So um, what can I learn? What is, the, what is the sensitivity of those lines? And, uh, and what, I can, what can I learn about my sample using those fluorescence lines? 
So first I look at the spins, right? I start out, I have a 3D5 configuration. So in the ground state, uh, my LS term, L, uh, 2S plus 1, um, L term is a sextet S, right? It's a, it's a zero angular momentum, and I have five spins um, pointing up, right? And then I uh, photo ionize, so I put one electron into, into continuum with a P symmetry, and what remains is a quintet or a septet um, S state, um, so that you have to count the spin here in the 1S shell together with the spins in the 3D shell. So this spin here in the, in the, in the core hole can point up or down, can be parallel to the 3D electrons or anti-parallel to the 3D electrons. Okay, um, so one gives you, of course, this is the septet and this is the, um, the quintet state. Um, and by the way, I indicated this a little bit. So this state is a little bit lower in energy than this state. It's only 50 milli electron volts, but it's still lower because of the Hans rule, because of this exchange interaction between the spins, okay? So now let's say this state decays and you keep the spin orientation of the electron in the, in the core hole, uh, well, you keep it and then you reach a septet P in the final state. And in this case, you reach a quintet P in the final state, okay? And again, you have the interaction, the, the energy difference here is again the exchange interaction between the 3P electron here and the 3D electron here. It's again the exchange term that I explained to you before. And the exchange energy lowers this energy. So it's lower, the septet P is lower in energy than the quintet P, okay? So that's very nice. So we have now atomic multiplet theory, and this can explain the K-beta lines to us. So this is now an experimental spectrum. This is the manganese K-beta line. Um, and you see, indeed, at lower energy, at lower emission energy, so that means the energy difference here gives you the, the emission energy. So the quintet P <coughs> is at lower energies. It's here. So this corresponds to this configuration. And at higher energies, I have the septet P. So now we have... The, the, the rough electron or spectral shape we have explained uh, using very simple uh, atomic multiplet uh, theory arguments, okay? And what is important is here the orientation of the unpaired spin in the, in the 3P shell, yeah? So you, you realize already this spectroscopy is sensitive to the spin state, right? Because there are spins interacting here. Um, but you see there's the shoulder. The shoulder here I have not explained yet. Um, but we can explain it. So what may happen, and that's why it's important to consider all electrons or many electrons in your, simple, uh, in your system, um, what can happen is when, when you have this decay is that one spin in the 3D shell flips over. You can calculate this very accurately. These are the so-called non-diagonal matrix elements. Um, Slater already in the 60s was able to calculate this. Um, there's a certain probability, a very strong probability actually, that this spin in the 3D shell flips over when I have a 1S to 3B. Uh, transition. And what you see, if you count the spins now, or if you look at the LS term, it's also a quintet P term. So the, the LS term of the entire configuration here is quintet P. Also this, so you can realize a quintet P final state using two different um, configurations. And that's very important because when I have the same total LS term, those, uh, those states interfere. Yeah, and that, that is part of the reason why I get this uh, intensity so strong for this, for this configuration here. Yeah? And this spin flip explains um, the shoulder here. So the shoulder B here is the spin flip. And it shows you, the, the shoulder is very pronounced, and it shows you that uh, the, the, the probability for the spin, slip, spin flip is very high. Yeah? What I want to show you in this slide here is that uh, the, the, the equivalence between the manganese K-beta lines that have a 3P hole in the final state and 3P X-ray photo emission. Because in both techniques, you reach the same final state. In one case, I first create a 1S hole, and then the 1S hole is replaced by a 3P hole, right? So I have a 3P hole in the final state. In the other case, I do photo emission. I take the 3P hole out right away, right? At the end, I have the same final states, and I com compare then, and uh, indeed, I turn this around because the photo-electron photo -electron people, they like to plot it the other way around. So that's why it's here in mirror, mirror written. Uh, yeah, but you get the same, you get the same states, right? This is the, the peak A, this is the septet P, quintet P, quintet P, right? You get the same states in K-beta as in photoelectron spectroscopy. The, spect the instrumental resolution is much, much better in photoelectron spectroscopy, um, but this is a hard X-ray probe. Okay, now the chemical sensitivity. We explained now the spectral shape of the K-beta lines. So what is the, uh, are there questions actually? Because this is quite important. Uh, questions there, is it all clear? I guess, no? Um, so what is, the, uh, what is the chemical sensitivity? Where does the chemical sensitivity come from? So I told you 
it's, a, it's, a, it's selective to the spin, right? It's, a, it's an exchange interaction. If I now change the spin state in my valence shell, I will get different energies there of the con configurations, right? Just because I have different exchange um, energies. Yeah, so if I have a manganese 3 plus and a manganese 4 plus, will give you different spectra, right? So I have a chemical sensitivity. And this is true, these are experimental data now. If I change now the formal oxidation state of, my, of the manganese and different fluorides, I see how my k beta line changes. It moves here to lower energies with increasing oxidation state, just because the spin state in my valence shell, this is the spin in the valence shell, changes as a function of the, of the formal oxidation state, yeah? So that's how I'm chemically sens sensitive. I'm sensitive to the spin state. So what is the of the charge. Is, is there a contribution at all of the charge? The charge, okay, we're not in the atomic world, but the charge moves, moves somehow, right? So how much contribution purely from the charge, I guess you could neglect the spin, how much contribution would you have in energy shape? That is, that, that is a very good question, again. Um, oh, it's a topic of discussion. There are various publications that came out recently and another one coming out uh, now very soon. Um, where people investigated to what extent my beta line changes because of the charge. There's one aspect that I haven't mentioned yet, or I think it's uh, Robin mentioned this morning. The reason why a line, a fluorescence line or J line may change is because of screening effects. If my valence, the valence electron density changes, you can say the electrons that are in the valence shell, they also have a certain probability of being close to the nucleus, right? Because the radial distribution um, is not a delta function, it has an extent, right? So also the electrons in the valence shell, they screen electrons in the 3p shell or even the 2p, right? So if I remove uh, uh, an electron from the valence shell, even my core levels, 2p or 3p, they will, they will move a little bit. The question is, by how much? Or you could ask the question, by how much does my charge actually change when I change my oxidation state? Um, people did calculations, and it's surprisingly little. The real charge, depending on how you project your charge on your ion, the charge by how much it changes. So we, we, we don't have a really ionic picture. We don't have a manganese 4 plus ion there. That's, uh, that, is, that is not true, right? So the real charge between the different oxidation states doesn't change very much. So people recently, there's also a group in Mülheim, uh, Fangnese, uh, the, here they investigated the, uh, to what extent the K-beta line shifts because of changes of the charge density. It's very little. It is really, uh, to a large extent, the spin state that causes the spectral changes, surprisingly, which is good for us because we are mainly interested in the spin state. And this has been used here around the corner at the, at the free electron laser at LCLS. Um, so what, what, what people do, they, they looked, uh, but you saw those images probably before, if you look at um, a protein, protein crystals, um, you, well, you excite them with a laser that can be important to reach excited states, obviously. Then you have your LCLS pulse. And then uh, they use an uh, X-ray spectrometer here um, that is dispersive. That means the X-rays, they come from the sample, and they hit this, uh, this spectrometer, and they hit the uh, a position sensitive detector. That then gives you <coughs> Um, the k beta lines, right? So the sample comes here, the X-rays hit the, um, the spectrometer, the analyzer crystal here, and then on a two-dimensional detector, I get my k beta lines. Um, and they change as a function of oxidation state. Yeah, and the people have done this a lot in, in, in proteins in order to understand the redox mechanisms um, in proteins. But what I wonder here, and that was an enormous discussion, I think, especially here in Stanford, um, Am I, at a free electron laser with this enormous brilliance, am I, should I, am I able to measure uh, k-beta lines of an intact sample? Why I'm asking this, you, you, all, saw, opala, you all saw those uh, pictures of the Coulomb explosion, right? You've all seen this before. <coughs> if I have a Coulomb explosion, and this is the discussion, I, I, I don't know the answer, but just to, yes, for the boat trip maybe. Um, if I have a Coulomb explosion, would I be able to measure a, an fluorescence line um, that is really reflects the ground state electronic properties or that corresponds to fluorescence line that I would measure at the synchrotron radiation source where I don't have this high brilliance? The argument there is that I have, I have my lifetime, the lifetime of the excited state. Well, the Coulomb explosion, I tell you my reasoning. The Coulomb explosion happens, correct me if I'm wrong, I strip off the electrons, right? And I have many charged particles, ions, and uh, the whole thing falls apart because they, uh, 
because of the repulsive force between the different between the ions. Um, of course, the, the argument there is that the, the atoms, they start moving after I measured my diffraction pattern, so I detect and then destroy. Uh, but the electrons, they, they react much faster, no? They should uh, react to the, to the pulse, to the electromagnetic wave from my, uh, from my free electron laser on, a, on an attosecond time scale. The lifetime of the intermediate state is a femtosecond, roughly. So my electronic structure should be destroyed much faster then my fluorescence decay occurs. So strictly speaking, I should not be able to measure my fluorescence line of an intact sample. The fact that we can do may indicate that we do not have a Coulomb explosion, maybe, under the conditions. But this is not entirely clear. So when, when you do this experiment, the spectroscopy the experiment at the LCLS, you don't need to focus the beam that hard, right? Your effective fluence could be as low as at the synchrotron. Well, it's the one shot that I mean, is important, here, right? Uh, it was one shot on one molecule. Did it do the diffraction pattern? Yeah, well, it's not a molecule, but it's a, it was nanocrystals or whatever. You, uh, you, you the focus, the beam was focused as much as possible. Beam it's the, the, the question, of course. The question is, do I have an Coulomb explosion or not? And uh, I mean, in principle, you ask the question with LCLS: Do you observe intact samples? The answer is depends. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if you really focus hard or if you focus loosely, not for all techniques you need to focus hard. So for spectroscopy, you don't combine it with like a diffraction method. In principle, you can exactly. You but can the do goal type of spectroscopy very well. You're exactly, you're right. But for this for this experiment, of course, the goal was to combine it with diffraction, right? Uh, okay. But it, it's, why I'm showing this is just to, to point out that the conditions for spectroscopy. Uh, of course, different than for um, diffraction in order to discuss whether I, I can measure an intact sample or not, right? Because in spectroscopy, I'm sensitive to the, electrons, the electronic configuration. It might react much faster um, than, the, than the Coulomb explosion occurs, right? Okay, another experiment that was done here, I'll show you some examples uh, here at the um, LCLS, is the, um, uh, on the spin crossover system. So this is ion twist by pyridine that can go by excitation of light. I can go from a ground state, which is a, a, a low spin term, a singlet A1. Um, I go, something funny happens here. It's not entirely clear. I may go to a triplet state and then finally go down to a quintet state. Um, this state here was probed at synchrotron radiation facilities already uh, extensively, and uh, this works. Um, but the big question was, what is happening here in between? Is there really a triplet state in between? And uh, and I'm not sure what I want to do. Ah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now a very obvious question. What kind of spectroscopy would you choose in order to study the spin state of the system? <laughs> well, it's obvious, but tell me anyway. <laughs> huh? EPR? Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's one possibility. I, I would propose K-beta spectroscopy uh, because it's so nicely sensitive to the spin state, right, via the exchange interaction. Um, OK. So in ion systems as well, if you go from high spin to low spin, these are experimental data and these are calculated data. Um, if I go from a high spin configuration, that's the black line here, to a low spin configuration, that's the green line here, um, I'm very sensitive to the spin state using the scape beta spectroscopy, as I pointed already out uh, to you before. Okay, and there's a publication that just came out recently. I think the PI here is Kelly Gaffney. Um, and they, they, these are again the k beta lines for ion in different, um, spin states, right, singlets, uh, triplet, quartet, quintet, and you very nicely see the, the changes then. And these are different spectra, right, because they like to measure transient spectra at, uh, in pump and probe experiments. And uh, these are the different spectra now between, you know, doublet minus uh, singlet, triplet minus singlet, quintet minus singlet. And then they compared uh, those spectra they measured on model systems. They compared those data then to the um, spectrum that they measured at a time delay between the um, optical excitation and the X-ray probe of 50 femtoseconds. And um, what they write here in the paper is that uh, this spectrum here proves really that I observe, I'm able to observe uh, the triplet state um, at 50 femtoseconds after the light um, excitation. Okay? So that's uh, just to, to show you an uh, example there. So the k beta lines are very sensitive to the spin state, and I can study um, spin crossover systems very nicely using uh, using this technique. Um, let's see, I don't have so, so much time left, um, so I, let me skip uh, a couple of things here. And I want to, uh, there's another nice technique that has not been used yet at the free electron laser, but will, I think, very soon, will be very soon. 
And that's, these are those uh, lines, right? Again, I go to my um, remove one S electron, and then I look. The final state that I look at is, uh, has a hole in the valence shell. So this, as I told you, I, I probe um, excitations that I can also, also observe in principle with a UV spectrometer. I observe excitations within the valence shell. So it tells me directly about the valence electron configuration, which is a very powerful technique. Yeah? If you look in the one ele um, electron diagram again, uh, you see transitions from the valence shell down to the 1s shell. And they are just here. You can imagine the Fermi energy would be here. So it's just below the Fermi level. Yeah? Why is it so weak? Because of uh, electronic overlap? Um, I'll tell you why in a, in a minute. You can imagine already, because what, 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 orbitals, what orbitals do I have in the valence shell of a 3D transition metal? It's a 3D transition metal, so I have 3D orbitals in the valence, right? A 3D to 1s transition is not dipole allowed. It's only quadrupole allowed. So it would be, from this point of view, already uh, extremely weak. But I can tell you already, we don't see 3D orbitals in those transitions. And I will tell you in the next slide what we see. Um, so transitions from the valence shell down to the 1s. Yeah? Um, the transitions, where do they come from? So I do not see the 3D orbitals. <clears throat> what can happen is that the orbitals that are on the ligands, so I have here uh, a metal center, and I have eight, uh, I'm sorry, six ligands around, so octahedral symmetry, six ligands around. Then I have the p orbitals of the ligands and the two s orbitals. Those p orbitals or s orbitals, they can form a molecular orbital, so I, I can do a linear combination of atomic orbitals to construct a molecular orbital. And this molecular orbital, has uneven, ungerade, uneven symmetry with respect to the metal side. Yeah? That means if I do an inversion, I, I project the orbital onto itself, but with a negative sign. Right? So it's uneven, uh, negative parity, basically, yeah? uneven symmetry. And the transition from such a molecular orbital to the 1s shell of the metal is dipole allowed. Yeah? And these are the transitions we see. So in this, in this, we call this valence to core emission spectroscopy. So emission lines just below the Fermi level. I am sensitive to the electrons that are on the ligand. Yeah? So I don't see my 3D orbitals in a 3D transition metal. So that's bad news if I want to study my 3D levels. But if I'm interested into, in, in the ligands, what kind of ligands I have, uh, then it's good news. And uh, it's shown here, if I, 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 for, I look here for chromium, for example. Um, so I have a chromium metal, that's the black line here. If I now put different ligands on my chromium, oxygen, carbon, chlorine, nitrogen, I see the, the ligand comes with a tag. I can, I can see from the, from the emission line here, I see what ligand I have. That's fantastic. So I have an element selective probe that tells me what kind of ligand I have. There's, to my knowledge, no other technique that can do this. Uh, Exos cannot do this because the, the ligands are too similar in atomic number. And it's a very nice, it's a very nice technique. It's very weak, line as you, weak lines, as you pointed out, so very difficult to do. Um, but I think there are experiments planned here at the LCLS where they will use those emission lines to study the ligand environment in, in proteins. Um, so this, this is coming up. And the beauty, another wonderful thing about this, um, this approach is um, I can model those data using ground state density functional theory calculation. I told you a little bit about the, 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 the problems I have uh, when, I, when I model inner shell spectra. I have to worry about the core hole. I have to worry about multiplet effects, <coughs> electron-electron interactions. In this case, because the transitions mainly arise uh, from electrons that are uh, in molecular orbitals that are localized on the ligands, I get very far with density functional theory. Um, and that's very nice. So what I do, I put the electronic structure of the molecule into my DFT code. I calculate the electron density. And you may know this, you have cone sham orbitals, where so you have something coming out, orbitals coming out of your, of your calculations. They're ground state calculations, so nothing fancy. Anybody can do this. They're codes you can download from the internet. Um, and then you just form the matrix element, um, one electron matrix elements, a dipole operator between the 1s shell of your, of your metal, I know manganese, and any filled molecular orbital. And, and this is what comes out. So the black dots here, so this is a titanium silicolite. So it's titanium in a silicolite, so in, uh, in, in silicon oxide, OK? Um, so the black dots here are an experimental spectrum. And the red uh, line is the, um, and you see the sticks here are the calculations, yeah? And you see you get a very nice agreement. Main problem here is this intensity is overestimated. We don't really know why. We're struggling to find out. Still, uh, the correspondence between the calculations and the experimental data is very nice. For an inner shell spectroscopy, this is, uh, we are already very happy with this, yeah? And you can learn, now, since the calculations work quite nicely, you can learn many things enormously about your, 
um, about the electronic structure of your system. Right? You can find out what ligands you have. You can distinguish between um, an oxygen ligand and a hydrogen, hydrox hydroxide ligand. Um, so it's a, very powerful, it's a very powerful technique that more and more people are using. And I'm sure in the future also at the free electron laser. Yeah? So I think I have five minutes or something. If um, just briefly, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. I cannot, it's a huge field. Um, I cannot cover everything. I just want to give you a little, a little flavor. Okay. So what I do, I showed you this diagram already many times before. Okay. Um, so I start in the ground state, and I have two, let's say, discrete excitations here. I have a continuum excitation there. I have the lifetime for the for the intermediate state, and then the state decays, and I have a final state here that is still an excited state. It also has a certain lifetime, right? There will be then a cascade decay. Ultimately, it will. A thermalized decay to the ground statement. Okay, so the, the difference between incident and emitted energy is the energy transfer, right? So that's the energy that remains in the sample um, if you consider the final state there. Okay, now again we play a little game. We try now to translate this energy diagram there that I showed you before. We translate this now into, into a spectrum. Yeah, when I measure RICs, I have two energies that I vary. I have the energy of the incoming light that would be my incoming monochromator. And I also have the energy of the final state. That would be my secondary spectrometer. You remember in the beginning I showed you you have an analyzer crystal in order to analyze the x-rays coming out. Yeah? So I have two energy scales, the incident energy here, and the energy transfer. Okay? So now we try to understand, we try to translate this energy diagram there into a Riggs plane. Okay? So I start, I give you the first point. I have an absorption here, so that means at a certain incident energy, and this Intermediate state now decays into a final state there. And I chose the final state energy here. Okay, now I have to see that if I, oops, oh God, no, I didn't want this anyway. <laughs> anyway, so if you, now you saw it already, but anyway, the idea is if I, um, if this intermediate state now uh, decays also to the second final state, right? So it's possible that one intermediate state decays into two final states. Okay, so the question is, where would I see this transition? Okay, so I think you saw it already. Uh, it's at the same incident energy, but at a different final state energy. It's clear? Yeah, so this is how you translate your, your, your energy diagram into, usually you do it differently, you, you measure this and translate it. Okay, but as a first step, I think it's easier this way. Okay, now uh, in the next step, let's say we go to the, to the next uh, the higher inter uh, intermediate state, and this intermediate state now decays to this state. Where would this point be? Uh, here? 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 Actually, ah, I, one line is missing, I'm sorry. That disappeared in the, in the presentation. There should be a line here. I'm sorry. It, should, it, it was supposed to be at a higher energy, but somehow it disappeared off the presentation. Yeah, so it's supposed to be at a little higher energy transfer. So it's at a higher incident energy and a higher transfer. Yeah? And, uh, and then we have also the continuum excitations. And they, interestingly, they appear as a diagonal streak. Yeah, because you vary your incident energy continuously, and the final state energy varies continuously as well. So excitations into this band here, they will appear as a diagonal streak in your explain. OK? So uh, why is it not how broad is this diagonal streak? Let's say it like that. You can, if you, if you have a fluorescence line, so if you go into a continuum, it's infinitely broad. Uh, infinitely broad, along in this direction, broad. Yeah, the, the width. The maybe, the maybe this <laughs> answers your question. Okay, it answers my question. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, what I, what, before I only looked at the, I neglected all lifetime broadenings. I'm not considering instrumental broadenings, but now I con consider my lifetime broadenings, right? And now I see how my lifetime broadenings now extend in the Riggs plane. Now, I, oh God, I'm, I, this, I made this too quickly, so I have to correct this. I'm sorry, so this is the intermediate state, so this should be gamma n and gamma f. Um, so the intermediate state um, lifetime broadening extends here in the horizontal direction, and the final state lifetime broadening extends in this direction. Yeah? So this is a, this is a model system, right? This is, this is not measured, but uh, it tells you a little bit how you can translate an energy diagram um, into, um, into the Riggs plane that you, that you actually measure. Um, and it's very important that, uh, that, that to see how the lifetime broadenings, they shape your, the intensity in the, in the states, yes? 
correlation between the manifolds there? A correlation between the two manifolds there? Does it appear as a diagonal elongation there? Or? So the transitions between those two states, they give rise to this diagonal there. The, the fact that they appear along the diagonal shows some correlation between them. Can you vary this somehow? Or? In principle, it shows you that um, it shows you that the, you replace one core hole here with another core hole. In principle, if it shows up diagonally like this, it shows you that the, the core hole does not really interact or it very weakly interacts with the photoelectron. If it does interact, you get some non-diagonal effects. If it starts interacting, it becomes non-diagonal. Um, you can, in principle, you can explain everything with a diagram like this. Um, if the core hole potentials are different in the two states, you get so-called non-diagonal features in your, in your Riggs plane. And if there's a strong electron-electron interaction as well, uh, there are many effects that can give uh, rise to non-diagonal -di effects. This diagonal streak now is, in principle, just a fluorescence line. That means you fully ionize your system, and the photoelectron does not interact anymore with, your, with the remaining ion. And then you have the fluorescence line. In this step, the fluorescence line coming out. And, um, um, and this gives you then, then, then rise to the diagonal streak. And again, the photoelectron, also in the final state, is non-interacting with the remaining um, ion. Um, that kind of works. Let me show you um, an experimental spectrum now. So we, uh, this is serum dioxide. So we measure an absorption spectrum, and we have the emission spectrum. I showed you this before. And this is now the Riggs plane, experimental Riggs plane um, of serum dioxide. And here it's a little bit magnified. Um, so in this case, we have a 2p3 half hole. In this case, we have a 3d hole. And the lifetime broadenings of the, of the 2p3 half states is horizontal here. And the final state is, is vertical here. Yeah? And what I can do, if I, take, if I take the integral of all spectral intensity, I get a conventional absorption spectrum. If I take a diagonal cut here, I, get, I, I obtain a, something called a high resolution uh, absorption spectrum. It's not really an absorption spectrum, it has to be careful. It's just a di diagonal cut through the Riggs plane. But what is important here, if you compare the conventional absorption spectrum to the high resolution spectrum here, that you, in the high resolution spectrum, you see many more spectral features. For example, you see the 4f orbitals that we discussed before. We see here in the high resolution spectrum, they hear those little features here. But you don't see this or barely see them in the conventional absorption spectrum. Yeah? The reason, and that's a very important point, Upala, the, the reason for this, um, for the sharpening effect is simply that I move kind of at 45 degrees relative to the lifetime broadenings here in my, uh, in my system. In order to observe the sharpening effect in, in this kind of Riggs spectroscopy, we do not need uh, interference, and there's nothing fancy going on. It's simply the fact that my lifetime broadenings, if I consider properly my lifetime broadenings, it comes out right away. It's nothing fancy. In principle, you can also consider this, let's say if you this, 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 this crosshair you put here, and then you consider your continuum excitations as an infinite number of discrete excitations, infinitely close to each other, you just move your, uh, your crosshair here, you move it through, and ultimately, and then you obtain this band. Yeah? And if you go through the maths, you realize that the lifetime broadening of your fluorescence line is the sum, is a convolution of two Lorentzians, so it's the sum of the two lifetime broadenings. Yeah? So there's nothing fancy in the Riggs process that gives rise to this sharpening effect. It's, it's rather banal. You just look at the Kramers Heisenberg equation, and you can collect all interference effects. It comes out um, correctly at the end. Okay. Um, well, what, what is interesting in the Riggs process, of course, if, you're done, if I reduce the, the, the energy transfer from, let's say, 1,000 electron volts, what I showed you before, to, let's say, one electron volt, and I mentioned this before, I can observe in the Riggs process um, low energy excitations. Yeah? These can be collective excitations, magnon excitations, DD excitations, charge transfer excitations. Uh, and this is what many people do using this Riggs process, right? So they reduce the energy transfer here to very small numbers, can be reduced to 50 milliEV, depending on uh, what kind of excitations you want to look at, yeah? And that's, uh, that's the idea <coughs> of the Riggs spectroscopy. And uh, just an example we measured here, this is uh, chromium in magnesium chromium oxide. This is the Riggs plane here, and the energy transfer is of, of uh, two, three electron volts. And we get two excitations here that you can then compare to um, UVV spectroscopy. And um, that shows you that, that you reach uh, the same final states in, in RICS, so a hard X-ray probe, um, as in UVV spectroscopy. Right? You see the same excitations. And with this, I thank you for your attention. 
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.